Good evening, everybody. Welcome. Are we all good and warm and dry and all the rest? Uh, so nothing happening in Washington, as we like to say. Uh, there's no reason for us to be here. There's no news going on in the world. Uh, actually, there's a lot of all of the above. I'm Frank Sesno. I'm director of the School of Media and Public Affairs. How many SMPA students are in the room? Awesome. Happy to see you. Um, and how many other students are in the room from elsewhere in the Look at that. That's amazing. Fabulous. Um, how many of you students have done internships and been in politics in one form or another? Worked for a candidate, worked on the Hill, worked at the White House, DNC, RNC? All right, so we've got a very engaged group and I think you're gonna see a very engaged conversation this evening. Um, we have, we're going to do this a little bit differently because we have been fortunate enough to have um, three groups of people, each of whom can bring a different perspective to this question, now what? The first uh, discussion will be between our moderator and esteemed co my esteemed colleague and Professor Stephen Roberts and Senator Amy Klobuchar from Minnesota. I should point out, um, she's a Democrat. You may have seen her in the Kavanaugh hearings. She's done a few things uh, that we've noted of late. Um, we did invite uh, Republicans from the Senate, and unfortunately, um, for, a, for a variety of reasons, very busy schedules, uh, none were able to make, us, make it, so we want to be sure that you know that, that we're not just doing a Democrat conversation because we like Democrats or because we're excluding anybody. In the next conversation, we have two members of Congress, a Democrat and a Republican. And I think you'll find them very candid, uh, very insightful, and probably a little different than what you've um, often heard uh, when you've listened to people from the um, wonderful House of Representatives. And the third panel is um, a remarkable panel of people who've been in Washington for a long period of time and will each bring a different perspective to what they will have heard from the Senate and from the House and what they will have known, um, because in the case of one of them, Maggie Haberman from the New York Times, who many of you I'm sure have read and seen and heard, um, really focuses on the Trump administration and what's going on inside the White House. So I hope by the end of the evening you have some sense of, of, of what's next. Um, but before I introduce uh, Professor Roberts and Senator Klobuchar, um, uh, anybody follow real Donald J. Trump tweets? You've seen his tweets and his comments. So he made a lot of news um, when shortly after the election, he was asked what happens if he's fiercely investigated? And he um, offered a remark that was, is both a, a reflection of how he feels and perhaps a uh, hint as to how um, we might actually answer this question. So let me take, ask you to take a look at uh, President Trump. The, the real question is, uh, you just sat up here and said that um, from this podium that it's, is, you're, are you offering an my way or highway scenario to the Democrats? You're saying no. that if, if, if they start investigating you, that you oh. can play that game oh, and yeah. investigate them. Better than them. Can you, com can you compartmentalize that? And I think I know, more, I think I know more than they know. Can you compartmentalize that and still continue to work with them for the benefit of the rest of the country? No. Or are you Are all bets off? No. If they do that, then it's just all it is is uh, a warlike posture. And so then, the, wait a minute, then the follow-up, I'm you sorry, heard, John. You heard my answer. Go well, ahead. Well, That's one reason why news conferences with President Trump are so much fun, but uh, a warlike posture. So what does he mean? What does that mean? What are the implications? Uh, Steve Roberts has been a political analyst, a journalist. Um, I first met him when we were both a bit younger, covering the White House. Um, he has covered more campaigns, more conventions, more politicians um, than most anyone uh, in this town. And he knows politics better than most anyone in this town. I can think of no one more qualified uh, or more fascinating uh, to lead uh, this evening's discussion. And Senator Klobuchar is one of the most level-headed um, and, and yet passionate members of the United States Senate. So I think um, you're in for a great conversation, a great series of conversations this evening. Um, and a little bit later on in the evening, we're gonna invite you uh, to ask some questions as well. But let's start by uh, welcoming, please, very warmly and with GW enthusiasm, Steve Roberts and Senator Klobuchar.
Well, delighted you all could make it through the snow. Um, and uh, Snow? <laughs> I am from Minnesota. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is like, anyway, never mind. And you also broke your foot today. No, I didn't break it. I had an x-ray because I, I just accidentally had a two-pound dumbbell fall on my toe. I accused her of doing the Ruth Bader Ginsburg uh, exercise. No, I did not. She, she it was said not it that. Um, Luckily, it was only two pounds. Everything is good. <laughs> are we at war? Are you at war with the president? <laughs> no. Um, I think uh, we have just come off a major national election, and what we should be talking about uh, is, uh, one, protecting the rule of law, something especially near and dear to our hearts, of course, in the Senate. Uh, where we want to make sure that the investigation is allowed to be completed. But um, we also need to find common ground where we can find it. And uh, there were a lot of people, a lot of citizens out there in America who uh, wanted to see a check and balance on this administration, but they also wanted us to get some things done. And that is everything um, from some ethics reform, which I know you'll be hearing from um, some members of Congress that they are working on, uh, to doing something about protecting people so they don't get kicked off their insurance for pre-existing conditions, to finally doing something about pharmaceutical prices, uh, something the president has said that he wants to do, uh, to rural broadband, uh, something that uh, my state cares a lot about. Uh, we have such problems in northern Minnesota with uh, getting coverage, and yet we can see Canada from our porch. And, you know, they have a lot of coverage up there. So, But when you see that clip from the president that was truculent, that mm -hmm. was um, defiant, uh, that was not talking about common ground at all. That was... He used the word warlike. When you I watch guess that's that, why we won the election. So you know that. Well, tell me that. Can, why do you think that? I mean, he um, he will, I'm sure, continue to act like that. But it is our job uh, to offer something different for the American people: a positive, optimistic economic agenda. Uh, that doesn't mean that we don't call him out on these things, and especially uh, when he, you know, starts doing things like uh, firing the attorney general the day after the election. And of course, there's a number of us questioning uh, this acting AG uh, and his positions, including uh, when he questioned uh, Marbury versus Madison as precedent, um, and when he questioned an investigation that he's supposed to be overseeing. So we have a, a very solemn duty to protect the rule of law. But at the same time, I've always said this, Democrats can do two things at once. Um, we can move forward for the people of this country as best we can. Um, and one of the things that I would like to see is um, more done, uh, my state's down to 2.8% unemployment rate, so uh, we need as much as we can get to get you students to go into careers that where we have jobs. We love you in Minnesota, you're all welcome. Um, and also to have comprehensive immigration reform, something that has become an economic imperative when you look at uh, some of the vacancy rates at companies in rural areas in the Midwest. So um, I, I'm not certain that he would move forward with that. Uh, but we have a new House of Representatives. The Senate has always had a bigger appetite for immigration reform, passed comprehensive immigration reform a few years ago. I don't think it'll be easy. But if we just keep uh, where we are right now, um, we're not going to be able to move ahead because I think we shouldn't be governing just from a crisis like he's been doing. We are at a point of economic stability and we should be governing from opportunity. And that's why it means we should pass some of the things I just mentioned. Otherwise, we're going to fall behind the rest of the world. Now, you said something interesting. You said that you thought the Democrats won in part because of the attitude that he displayed in that clip. Tell me what you mean, and tell me what you think were some of the other ingredients. Now, mm -hmm. it wasn't a complete Democratic victory. Uh, no, I'm you know, in the Senate. I'm aware of that. You know, yeah. uh, <laughs> one, two, three. You know, uh, two of the key states in, the, mm -hmm. in America, Florida and Ohio, you didn't do well in as Democrats. So, well, no, no, Ohio, Ohio. Uh, we won Ohio big time, Sherrod Brown. Uh, not the governor's race. Okay, but we won. Uh, but we also, I would, okay, so let me just, until we get back but, and but forth. Get, but, mm -hmm. but pick up on this point. You think, tell me why you think that clip we just saw helped the Democrats and what were some of the other ingredients in the races you did mm -hmm. in the election? So, um, first of all, I go back a bit to 2016, where Hillary Clinton had a lot to offer, um, I think, this country, and she would have been a very good president. Um, but 
some of the strategies, uh, in my mind, we left the Midwest behind. Uh, a lot of their, I remember seeing Trump lawn signs everywhere. Um, and I think lawn signs matter. A lot of people don't. But I think it's a personal stamp of approval if you put one you out a for a name, candidate. Dave. Oh, yeah, it's a real problem. Now, you have to have really long oval stickers so it fits. Um, and um, so there was a problem. We left the Midwest behind. I always use the analogy. My husband is the third of six boys. And they grew up in a mobile home. And they had a station wagon. And they would go on a one trip a year. And they would load everyone in. And then they'd go and stop at a gas station. And my husband was always a quiet kid, and I think they were often afraid that they left him behind at the gas station. Maybe it happened once. And so they would count, right, to see what kids were there and make sure they were there. Well, what happened in 2016 is we left the Midwest behind at the gas station. Um, that didn't happen this time. And yes, we did not win every race. And I was so sad to lose my good friends, uh, Claire McCaskill and Heidi Heitkamp and Joe Donnelly. Uh, but what we did win was the Wisconsin governor's race that a lot of people didn't predict, uh, the Illinois governor's race, which a lot of people did predict, uh, the Kansas governor's race. I did their Democratic dinner, and Laura Kelly uh, will be an incredible uh, governor. Um, so we, we won and picked up a number of governor seats, including congressional seats, like the two in Iowa, uh, like uh, Angie Craig uh, and Dean Phillips in Minnesota. Um, so overall, when you look at the House and you look at that dramatic change in numbers and the diversity that we ended to the House, yes, that was a win. The governor's races were a win. In a state like Minnesota where we flipped the House um, and we of the state House and also won every constitutional office, that was a win. So there were a number of states, despite what is clearly work uh, that we need to do to continue working with people in rural areas. I visit all 87 counties in my state every year. I won half my rural counties in Minnesota. I believe that you go not just where it's comfortable, but where it's uncomfortable. Um, and uh, we have to do more of that in the rural areas. But overall, um, well, I would say key, we won. What were the key ingredients? The key ingredients was this. Good candidates, not neglecting areas like the Midwest and some areas in the South and you know the West when you see the what the those Senate wins in Arizona and Nevada, um, and then also this is the key ingredient is a clear economic agenda. Um, it was a lot about health care. And we felt that was important because the other side was trying to repeal the Affordable Care Act, which would have meant appealing, repealing things like keeping your, you on your parents' insurance until you're 26, if you're interested in that. Um, um, doing things like protecting the pre-existing well, condition. Get jobs, they don't have to be on their parents. Oh, yeah. OK, good. <laughs> um, uh, so you know that was a unified message from our party on health care and on some other issues as well. Um, what happened in 2016 is we ran down every rabbit hole with Donald Trump. And that doesn't mean we don't keep our ground. Like, if we were going to uh, respond like some of what was going on in 2016, we, everything he brought up in a tweet, we would have had like an academic forum here every day on it. Well, we didn't do that. We stuck to an optimistic economic agenda for this country. In my state, we ran on one Minnesota. Yes, there were anti-immigrant attacks and racist attacks against our candidates, but we kept focused on that economic agenda, complete with plaid shirts in the governor's race. Everyone wore plaid. So we, we kept a unified theme, and we did it. We tried to localize to what the state interests were as much as possible. But it's interesting because you look at the national, and you mentioned the unemployment rate in Minnesota under 3%, nationally at 37 um, Every economic index, except for the occasional uh, flips in the stock market recently, are very positive. Uh, people in, the, in one poll I saw had the, had the most positive economic uh, outlook in 18 years. Now, how does the economic issue work for the out party wow. in a time when there's, the economy is so uh, prosperous and the in party generally benefits from that? Interesting question. Um, and first Thank of all, you. I would attribute this to our workers uh, who are incredible. I always say if we can compete against the best in America, we win if we are on an even playing field. So our workers and our businesses, and they're strong. And we came out of a 
humongous downturn, the worst since the Depression. And as you know, uh, under President Obama and because of these businesses and workers, things were getting better and better. And that economic stability has continued. But what I think the voters were saying, the citizens were saying is, wait, um, what's happened to me? Have I seen a change in pharmaceutical prices like this administration promised? No. Of the top 10 selling drugs, four have gone up, doubled, tripled in cost, insulin through the roof. So they didn't see a change there. And they saw a lot of our new Democratic candidates, especially some of the ones that were gr running um, uh, with new messages and fresh ways of looking at things. You know, they saw them as a way that would bring that change. Um, they saw that it was still not easy for them to go to college or uh, to find a way forward. There were people that felt very strongly that the mean-spirited rhetoric um, was not good in the long term for our nation. And I think they saw particularly hmm, women, tax think? bill was seen as kind of a mixed bag. But overall, I think a lot of people saw it as not helping them. Hmm? Well, I was going to ask, uh, uh, because so many of the votes, uh, the candidates who won were women, and, and virtually everyone uh, won on the strength of women's votes. Mm -hmm. uh, poll I saw, women voted 19% Democratic, men 4% Republican in the exit polls. Um, what would, tell me why you think the Democrats had such an advantage among women and what difference it will make. Now in the Senate, you point out, Senators Heitkamp and McCaskill were defeated. Senator Sinema from elect from Arizona will join you. But in the House, a vast increase. First time in history, more than 100 women in the House. Mm -hmm. What difference is this going to make, you think, um, uh, to have so many more women in positions of influence? Well, I think we've reached that tipping point. So it's going to make uh, an extraordinary difference for uh, little girls growing up in every single state now. Um, before this, we didn't have someone from every single state. Um, um, in the House or Senate um, until I think this may be it now, um, that we have someone in a congressional delegation. Uh, we have, uh, so that is role models um, for girls growing up to think that they can do this kind of job too. Um, it means some um, different issues. I think about when we were debating the Affordable Care Act and Senator Stabenow, there weren't many women on the Finance Committee at the time, and one of the male senators said, well, I don't know why we need maternity care in the mandatory benefits. I never needed it. And, <laughs> and she said, without missing a beat, I bet your mother did. <laughs> um, and so, you know, having that voice at the table or just this last, and just to give you a sense of the Senate, and the House has similar ratios, I think, but in the Senate, in the history of the Senate, there's been something like 2,000 men um, and a little over 50 women. Think about that. Until this last uh, year, 52 women, 2,000 men. I noted that statistic on the Trevor Noah show, and he said if a nightclub had a ratio that bad, it would have to shut down. Um, <laughs> and so that is what, that is what. And more um, than half of them are sitting now. When you you're say right. 52, so this is the arc the that we're on, this arc of change. Um, and it is going to mean big things. Uh, hopefully, you know, more emphasis on some of these common sense pocketbook issues. I'm not naive that women have different ideologies, but in the Senate where we've had a more close-knit group, um, Harvard did a study and showed we worked together better, we got things passed better, uh, we got things done. And then uh, you just have even my favorite thing of the year was when Tammy Duckworth, um, decorated war hero, came to me, no legs, um, and had come home, of course, run for Congress, gotten married, had a baby, and announced to me at a 50 years old she was having her second baby um, and that she just didn't think it was fair that you couldn't bring uh, babies on the Senate floor when you could do that in the House and could we at least do it during votes because when we vote at 2 in the morning and she's got a toddler at home um, and maybe her husband will stay with the toddler but it's just really hard. And so I said, no problem. <laughs> what a nightmare. <laughs> and I found out for centuries we had not changed a rule except to allow a dog on the floor once. And I um, started working all the people to get this done and Senator Blunt worked with me on it, Roy Blunt. And um, then my favorite moment was Senator Hatch said to a group of reporters, somewhat in jest, <laughs> well, maybe we can have one baby on the floor, 
but what if we have 10 babies on the floor? And I said, we already have 10 babies on the floor. <laughs> um, and so finally, um, uh, we were able to get it done, and she rolled herself out on the floor when there was a close vote um, with that tiny little less than 10-pound baby. I think it was six weeks old. Um, and uh, it was the first baby to ever be on the floor, and little Miley Pearl slept through the entire historic moment. Um, you know, it's things like that where you know if change can come to that workplace, um, change can come to all workplaces. Nice story. Um, tell me what, as you think ahead, you've now, as you said, had a lot of good um, results for the Democrats in this last uh, election, a couple of disappointments in Florida, Georgia. Well, um, okay. well, yeah, in the governor's race, but they just called for a manual recount in the Florida Senate race, so I'd just like to point out that. Um, I want to know what, <laughs> I want to know, as a result of all of these races in the off-year elections, what have you learned about how to beat Donald Trump in two years? What, what's the emerging profile of the nominee who can beat Donald Trump? Uh, well, first of all, we're going to have a lot of people running and a lot of competition, and I think that's important that people come uh, with different takes and different styles and from different parts of the country. Um, but um, I think that we have learned, um, and I believe in facts. I'm a former prosecutor, and I try my best to have all uh, the right evidence and to study up, and I think that's important. I mean, I think a lot of people that I know that are considering running for this job are like that. Um, but I also think it's important uh, to, he is a very, he gets people going emotionally, right? So you have to meet emotion with emotion. But this doesn't mean it has to be negative emotion. Uh, it can be aspirational and unifying emotion. Um, and, um, you know, I, I, I think about things like when I was running in this last Senate race, when I talked about pre existing conditions, I just didn't say pre existing conditions because <laughs> half the people don't always know what that means. Um, I said, told the story of a woman with her baby carriage in a parade in northern Minnesota um, uh, with this uh, probably two, three year old with Down syndrome. And she said, This is my little boy, and I will do anything for him, everything for him but you're looking at it, this is a pre-existing condition. So I just think it is really important um, to meet him where he is in terms of where people are um, feeling emotionally because that is, that is what he does. Um, and it's also important to call him out when he um, is talking about things that violate just the very spirit of our constitution and our laws. It's important to get people who have your back uh, that are maybe not Democrats and independents, and Hillary had some of that going on, but I think that will be important to make the case uh, for why in the long term alienating the world is not how we want to go with our economy, and it's not where we want to go uh, with our national security and our foreign relations in terms of our allies. Um, so it's going to be a number of things, but one of the lessons we've learned is um, and we certainly learn from these campaigns is, well, he's going to get a lot of attention because, you know, it sells on the news. We get this. You've got to set your own agenda. Um, tell me about um, what you think his uh, political strengths are. I mean, uh, he surprised a lot I of can't, I can't. No, come on. Tell no, me. I know. Because, I just, I just, uh, he surprised a lot of people, he, uh, including a lot of pundits, and, mm -hmm. uh, including a lot of people around here. Uh, obviously, he has... Uh, political skills, whatever else you think about him, that are pretty impressive, uh, or else he wouldn't be where he is. So tell me what you think of the, the skills he will bring to the table that are gonna cause you problems, that you have to worry about. Uh, well, I think just uh, for generally speaking for our party here and uh, for the people that will run, I mean, he is um, more than a household name. He's got a huge, you know, he's got sort of a following of people that probably won't break away from him, but I think the key here in what we saw in the midterms um, is that there were independents and some Democrats and certainly some Republicans that voted for him before that is starting to have a lot of second doubt um, about what he stands for, and I think it is really important um, to point that out. Um, he uh, is someone that um, is the master of tweeting and um, getting his news out and getting his ideas out and his names out. And so uh, having a strategy from the beginning um, when you're 
if someone's running against him, which is very aware of that, and certainly people will be more aware of that uh, than before. Um, and he also is um, really good at keeping with one message, um, or maybe three messages. You know, we know what it all was leading into the midterms. It didn't work, but we know what it was, right? Uh, some on economics, which was fair game um, in terms of the economy, but mostly that got totally blown away from caravan, uh, mobs, and Kavanaugh. So those were the three message points. And he came to my state uh, twice um, in the last few months. Um, so I'm very well aware of what that message was. But so we um, responded to some of that, but not in a way that dominated um, what our economic message was and our one Minnesota message. Um, are you running for president? I am just really happy sitting up with you right now. I just got over, I just got through my election literally a little over a week ago and I can't tell you how focused I was on that because we had a governor's race, two Senate seats, um, four or almost five hugely contested congressional races. So uh, that's where my focus has been. Um, has been. And I'm, I'm going to, no, forward. I'm going to be having Thanksgiving with my family and <laughs> I am going to have some sweet potato casserole, which I always like, and that's what I'll be doing in the next week. So. Does it have marshmallows in it? Uh, it's, well, if my mother-in-law makes it, yes. Yes, it does. <laughs> um, Pecan version. Anyway. Do the Democrats have to nominate a woman? Um, I, uh, no, I, uh, but I hope there'll be a woman on the ticket. Um, I think that time has come. and. Um, I, so we will see who, who the candidates are. We're just going to have a lot of people running, and I think it's important, to, as I said, to have voices from everywhere, um, including from the Midwest. But it's not just, it's not just the Midwest. There's a, a gathering left versus right, or left versus um, almost left, uh, of you in the Democratic Party. You had some uh, new, uh, uh, new members who say that the answer is uh, to bring the party to the left. Uh, others who say that's exactly the wrong message from the election, that despite a few uh, examples of uh, very liberal candidates winning, that Bernie Kratz are not the future of the party, that it's much more of a centrist or a pragmatic uh, profile. What do you think? Well, that's a good question of some of the Democratic House members that are coming up, because I don't know their individual new House members as much as I know the ones from Minnesota. But I really saw that it was uh, uh, people from um, the, the, the left, the middle, even some conservative Democrats that got elected. I think part of that message was we, stay un we stayed unified. Uh, we didn't look for the differences. We truly believed that brought us together was bigger than what divided us. And that's going to be really important in 2020. I can't predict for you who that candidate will be, but I think it's going to be really important that it's someone who's authentic, that's true to themselves. Um, and I think you saw that whether someone was running um, on one side of our party or on the other side of the party, that's what mattered. And they wanted someone, people they could believe in. Um, and you can debate various policy things, but you know, you're gonna have to have someone that has a compass um, and is able to um, lead the party. And I just refuse to say um, ideologically exactly where that person will be. Um, but one thing that we learned is that you've got to meet people where they are. And I love that about our candidates this time. I saw it in our own state. Um, they just felt that the country and their service was bigger than not, and, I, and our voters really, than not crossing every box of, of do, uh, a litmus test in our party. And I think that was really, really important. It sounds to me like you're running for president. No, I am telling you the truth of Minnesota. We elected uh, Colin Peterson, who's one of the most conservative Democrats, and uh, we campaigned together the last week. And uh, we elected, uh, you know, Ilhan and Betty McCollum, and it was. We're just really. Our state is a state that is just to give you a sense of why I get where this big divide and also this big spectrum is that we have iron ore mining and we are fourth in the country for agriculture exports and we are in the top few per capita for Fortune 500 companies. Uh, we have a lot of Mayo Clinic and a lot of thriving small businesses, um, strong workers, and it's just it just gives me a sense of, um, of that you don't have to have a one-size-fits-all candidate in the Democratic Party. 
Will you come back if you're running? Uh, yes. So, well, okay, I will. No, I, you, you are. <laughs> You asked me if I'll come back, and I said I'll come back. And yeah, if I when I I would make any announcement, of course, with you on the stage. So. All right, Frank, thank you, you heard that promise. Okay. Thank you, Senator thank Klobuchar. You. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we've got um, stage two. Thank you again, Senator. We really appreciate it. Um, and now we have um, uh, our uh, members of the House. Um, my, uh, for many years, uh, I, my mother-in-law and father-in-law were members of the House for a combined total of 50 years, and they used to v object to the notion of the House being the lower House. They used to say, well, the Republicans are the rivals, but the Senator are the enemies. So, um, uh, we got, where, where are they? Come on. Congressman uh, uh, Brendan Boyle represents uh, he was telling me he's a Democrat, Congressman Brendan Boyle, from uh, Philadelphia, his new district. Uh, see, you got a lot of your fans here. Um, his new district is gonna be just entirely in the city of uh, Pennsylvania, uh, Philadelphia. Now he has, as many of you know, there's a lot of redistricting in, in, in Pennsylvania. Represents the northern part of the city. Um, and uh, uh, Jennifer Gonzalez uh, uh, is a, uh, uh, you gotta tell me your title. <laughs> Jennifer. Representative. Representative. Um, uh, from, from Puerto Rico, uh, and a Republican from Puerto Rico. Uh, and um, uh, she uh, has all of the privileges in the House, uh, except she can't vote on the floor, but she can vote on committees. And um, uh, we're delighted to have you both with us. Thank you. Um, Thank you. And uh, turn here. I, I want to get your name exactly right, Jennifer Gonzalez Colon. Um, and um, I'm going to start, uh, uh, Jennifer, with you. Uh, and um, I want to ask you to reflect on the question I asked um, uh, Senator Klobuchar. Uh, particularly in the House, this was not a particularly good night for Republicans. Um, uh, and as the voting uh, votes continue to be tallied, the Democratic margin is, uh, uh, is uh, increasing. I know this was a historic trend, and I know that a lot of Republicans, including the president, says history was the main reason. But what are some of the other reasons that you feel helped contribute to, the, uh, uh, to such a surge for the Democrats in, in the House races? First of all, thank you for the invitation and uh, good night to everybody. Um, coming from the Caribbean, we are not used to the snow, so um, <laughs> my reference a Amy would, not be, the will, uh, my reference would not be the, the same one of the senator uh, yeah. for that reason. Uh, but first of all, I mean, uh, I was, before being a member of Congress, I was in the State House. And I was Speaker of the House, and I, I was then Minority Leader, so I was there for 14 years in the State House. So seeing majorities and minor uh, uh, minorities every, every, in every cycle is, is something like normal. Uh, and historically, that happens to many other presidents. Uh, we, of course, there were more than uh, 35 members that were not uh, running again for re-election, and the Democrats just won 35 of those, those seats, uh, including eight races that are still uh, to call. So that, that number may change. Uh, of course, that, that would mean that in general we will have a, a Democratic majority. But what's the importance about that? I mean, I think this is a time to, to get compromises. And we may, may have different kind of views in, in, in many issues that ideologically uh, can set us up, up apart. But having a, a, a Democratic House and a Republican Senate and a Republican administration, uh, I think we can have that as an opportunity to what can be achieved. And most of the people may say, uh, this is gonna be a war. Uh, but you know, I do understand that uh, in the House, at least from my experience, you know, we all represent districts, and we, we want to get things done. And uh, there, there are going to be several opportunities to, to get things done. One of those is going to be the infrastructure package uh, that will mean a lot of investments for a lot of states and a lot of districts uh, that will put people working to one goal. The second one is compromise or uh, reaching an agreement may not need to be surrender. And, and sometimes uh, people understand that when you achieve that kind of a compromise or a deal, uh, it means that you <coughs> surrender your ide ideals or, 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 or... But let me ask you something candidly. 
Everybody says that. Everybody gets elected and said, oh, it's now time to find common ground and work together, and it doesn't happen. In the last, in the last Congress, it was probably the least productive Congress in, in, in modern memory in terms of any kind of bipartisanship. I, I, I do not agree with that, prim uh, with that uh, statement, uh, because in, in terms of, my concern is that in the Senate side, we got that problem. I mean, we, you, you, in the House, a lot of things were approved in a bipartisan way. Other, other in, 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 in the case of Puerto Rico, I will tell you that uh, my, my whole experience. Uh, people want to score, point, score points you know, against, against the president, but it was a lot of members uh, getting a, a side of the party lines to, to get things done. The Senate side, on the other, on the other hand, because of the slim majority uh, we got there, uh, a lot of things always get stuck. I mean, House just passed more than 100 bills. Most of them are still waiting in the Senate. But it's always like that. The Senate is always like that. Um, in, 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 but virtually none of those. But virtually none of those bills of any significance were passed with bipartisan. Votes. I, mean, I think. I mean, the, 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 the tax reform is is one of the examples of what things can be done, and that's the reason you got a three point seven percent unemployment and a lot of the economy is growing. We may defer in a lot of several issues, but I think, I mean, you, you get a president that may tweet something that is very controversial. Uh, I got that experience a lot. Uh, but when you actually get bills introduced and work in a common sense in many areas, I mean, you got a, a lot of bipartisan work being done. It will not always get, uh, you know, the prime time news, but it, it's happening. Uh, it's happening every time, and I, I don't know how, how much is the percentage of that. But I think this sh should be an opportunity. I was I saw a tweet of the president saying that he will even uh, lend some votes to, to uh, Minority Leader Pelosi to achieve their speakership uh, last week. I mean, who will think about, you know, who who would ever uh, think something like that? I know. People want to score points uh, in each uh, side of the aisle, uh, but I, I think it will it will be if there's an agenda. I think common ground may be found if you want to achieve something. If you just came with with you know vengeance or scoring points, and then we're going to be having a fight of all issues. Congressman Boyle, you heard Jennifer. You heard the president say you know warlike footing if Democrats use their power in the House, uh, now achieving the committees, having subpoena power. Uh, um, what's your view of all, everybody talks about common ground bipartisanship. Is that in any way a realistic possibility in the new Congress? I think it depends on the issue. Um, and it depends on the time that you're talking about. So, I mean, just thinking of recent history of the last 30 years, you saw a few major compromises back in 1996 when Newt Gingrich, after there had been the government shutdown, and you had uh, Newt Gingrich and the, the Senate Republicans attempting to force their will on, on then President Clinton, who at the time was not especially popular. Um, once President Clinton stared down that shutdown, then come the summer of 1996, suddenly interests aligned a little bit differently, and you had welfare reform yeah. and two other major reforms that were achieved. So. I, I know it depends, sounds like a fudge, but it, it really is the accurate answer. Um, let me highlight one area, Jennifer mentioned it as well. And in retrospect, I gave a prediction which, which proved not to be correct yet. Uh, two years ago, I was on a TV program and I'd said a number of things that were very critical of, of President Trump, um, all very justifiably. And, and so the, um, the reporter asked me, oh, well, you know, given your posture, is there anything you could agree with the president on? I said, actually, I'm excited about the possibility of getting the first real big infrastructure plan passed out of Washington, D.C. over the last 40 years. I thought President Trump was going to lead with that. I think, I still think he would have been wise if he had done that instead of the repeal and replace failed effort. Now that you have a Democratic House, you still have an hourly Republican Senate, and you have a Republican president who was the first time in the presidential primary era who did not win the president, Republican presidential nomination as a fiscal conservative. He's a guy who on trade and on spending uh, was not the more doctrinaire fiscal conservatives that have been the case since 1980 on. I do think infrastructure represents the best possible uh, area for, for compromise, and, and I actually think that that will be achieved. But isn't that because the one thing everybody can agree on in Capitol Hill is to spend the taxpayers' money? 
I mean, not the problem, necessarily. If there were, I mean, there's one well, word that, that you, easy, never, you it, never hear the word deficit in Washington anymore. No. I mean, it's been I, co but totally abandoned. I mean, it's easy to say, yeah, we're going to spend $50 billion, or whatever it's it is. Not, it's, it's so, not so I mean, so if, I'll just add real quick. If it were that easy, it would have been done at some okay. point in the last 20, 30 years. You do need some sort of uh, pay for which is a very inside the beltway, terrible term that I don't use when I'm back home, but essentially a way to pay for it. Um, Most Americans so, actually can figure out the notion of paying for their own bills, don't you think? Yes, but I mean, when we sometimes here in DC that too often members in Capitol Hill, like myself, speak in this DC lingo yeah. of pay for and <laughs> omnibus and um, you know a CR, and I, I try to break out of that habit, but I don't think infrastructure is, is uh, unfortunately as easy as, as you presented. My last year in the state legislature, which is what I did before this, um, we did achieve, and Pennsylvania state legislature mirrors the national political wins pretty, you know, in a pretty representative way. Uh, we had uh, Democrats who voted for this bill, Democrats who voted against it, or Republicans, more mainstream Chamber of Commerce type suburban Republicans who voted for it more Tea Party type Republicans who voted against it, and we were able by one vote in the state legislature to get past a major uh, infrastructure bill which included revenue increases. And I feel like that actually is the, for how, if and when we would achieve it in Washington, D.C., it's that same sort of political math. And Jennifer, let me ask you this. Uh, one of the important constituents of, of, of growing power in American politics are Hispanic voters. Um, and uh, Republicans have warned repeatedly over the last few years, a famous autopsy that they did, if Republicans did not do a better job of appealing to Hispanic voters, that demography would relegate the party into minority status. Um, in this last election, I think it was roughly about two to one, uh, Hispanics voted uh, Democratic over Republican, and in some states it was higher than that. States like Arizona, Nevada, Hispanics helped elect Democratic senators almost did in Texas. Um, t give me your take on um, the Republican Party's uh, posture to uh, Hispanics, and particularly, are you worried that uh, the president's attitudes on immigration are gonna make it harder for the Republican Party to attract Hispanic votes going forward? I think it's, it's not just about the policy, it's, it's how to refer, and, and sometimes we refer to Hispanics as a whole. And it will depend on the state, I mean, like, like everybody else. I mean, we're gonna be 28 million Hispanics uh, with the right to vote in, in the next election. Uh, and that number will continue to increase uh, dramatically. Um, I will tell you what happens in, the, in this election in one state, Florida. Uh, there's one than, more than a million Puerto Ricans living there. Uh, and uh, usually a lot of those Puerto Ricans always vote uh, in a Democratic uh, uh, ballot. Why? Because I, I will say Democrats are very uh, clever in, in reaching out Hispanics. Uh, it's like a common thing. Uh, and uh, I think the Republican Party uh, never before have uh, actually an agenda uh, to reach out the Hispanic community. And uh, during this election, uh, it was an effort in Florida specifically uh, to reach out to the Hispanic uh, community. And, and that's the reason the, the Cuban community and the Puerto Rican community actually voted in, in, in big, bigger numbers than ever uh, with Governor Rick Scott for the Senate side. Senate side. And same thing with DeSantis. Um, that may not be the same case in the rest of the states, uh, but that was uh, something that ARNC actually put uh, a team of people working the Hispanic community. Uh, and what was, the, what was the essence of their appeal that made them more successful, you think, in Florida than um, Republicans were in some of the other states where I think, Hispanics I think the were. issue of Florida uh, being the second uh, state with more uh, own, uh, business own, uh, owners being Hispanic in the nation after California, uh, the way uh, the governor promoted the agenda of opportunity and, and growth, and in the case of Puerto Ricans, uh, it was supporting statehood. I mean, the case of Ron DeSantis and Rich Scott both uh, supported statehood early on in, 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 their, in their races, never before uh, a candidate to, to, to that post 
goals uh, reach out directly to the community. Uh, so I think it, it's, it, it's, it's going to be different uh, kind of issues and the respect uh, and, and taking people not for granted, but actually providing this, that space. And that's what we're looking, the space uh, to, to discuss the idea. And, and I mean, a lot of Hispanics are very conservative in, in their beliefs. Uh, you know, they do support uh, free enterprise, they do support uh, our military and, and, and religious, uh, uh, you know, uh, basis. I mean, in Puerto Rico, that's uh, a big issue. Uh, but again, you, you, you just can't let out the Hispanic community because you, you don't want to be uh, reaching out different kind of minorities. And, and that will change dramatically uh, for the next election. Brandon, last thing I ask you about the issue that the president talked about in that clip. Now that Democrats have the power, that you don't have a lot of power to pass legislation, but you have a lot of power to uh, organize committees, to hold hearings, to subpoena documents, to investigate whether it's the president's tax returns or uh, many, other, many other things. What's your view about how the Democrats should be handling that power? And what are the risks involved of overreaching? Yeah, so first I, I thought Amy Klobuchar uh, responded exactly right to that question. I used the line that we can walk and chew gum at the same time. So we can focus on infrastructure, we can focus on making sure the ACA isn't rolled back and in fact, in fact actually fortifying the ACA and building upon it, while at the same time ensuring that the Constitution of the United States is followed and that we exercise oversight. And by the way, oversight means Yes, subpoenas and investigations were appropriate, but it also means, for example, I'm on the Foreign Affairs Committee. In two years, we've had, unlike previous administrations, Democratic and Republican, we've had barely any administration witnesses come before us to testify about what happened in Helsinki with the bilateral summit. What happened um, between President Trump and Kim Jong-un? We've had very little of that sort of oversight function, which as a co-equal branch of government, it is our responsibility to do. Now, to your point about overreaching, I, again, this is where, uh, you know, I, I think being a political junkie and knowing it, at least recent political history is helpful because I think back to that Gingrich Congress in the 1990s, I think even back to how much time the Republicans in 2011 and 2012 spent uh, in investigations. If you just do that and are, uh, seem to be unreasonable, you actually will end up turning off voters. Uh, in many ways, Democrats picked up seats in 1998 because of impeachment, because they thought that the Gingrich Congress, uh, Republican Congress, went too far. So I'm very mindful of, of those examples of overreach. I do not think that our side is gonna be guilty of practicing that. But there are members who, on day one, are gonna start talking about the I word, impeachment. We've What's your reaction gonna be? So we've already voted, a lot of people don't know this, but uh, because of a colleague of mine, Al Green from Texas, we voted twice on launching impeachment proceedings. It got about 60 or so votes, uh, both times about 370, 380 votes against. I voted against it. My posture has been, make sure we protect the independence and the integrity of the Office of Special Counsel. That should be our focus. We cannot allow a repeat of the Saturday Night Massacre, which was really the beginning of the end for President Nixon. That was when you saw the first articles of impeachment related to Watergate uh, introduced in, in late 73. So my focus has been, and I'm co-sponsor of a bill that would do this, um, to ensure that we protect the special counsel's investigation. And then when the Mueller report is finally in front of us in Congress, then we have to deal with it based on the facts. And by the way, I still think, um, and this is my own you know, somewhat educated guess, that 95% of what the Office of Special Counsel has uncovered, uncovered, we don't yet know. They have been remarkably immune hmm. from leaks. The only thing we do know about that process is from what witnesses who've been in front of the grand jury have come back and selectively said of their experience. So, I mean, just think back to last year when a couple of indictments were coming down, like of George Papadopoulos, and people had never even heard of his name until the morning that he was indicted. So I, I tend to think that there's still a lot going on that we, none of us really know about until the Office of Special Counsel has concluded its work. Um, 
So uh, you would continue to have this view that impeachment is not a good idea, at least. No, I, I would say that it's not that you don't, you know, halfway through the trial, you don't exactly go to the jury that, um, by the way, I'm not a lawyer at all, but at least <laughs> I've, I've watched enough you you watched know, L TV. Law and Order and L.A. Law that uh, you know that part. Um, so I, I continue to have an open mind about it and that we should follow the, the, the facts where they lead. Um, but that, that's, that lives right now in the Office of Special Counsel. Let me ask you one other quick question uh, about the Democrats. Uh, there continues to be talk about a challenge to Nancy Pelosi as Speaker. Do you think that challenge will materialize? Will it be serious? Y Steve, I hadn't heard about that, so I will... Um, <laughs> then you I, weren't watching TV today. <laughs> I, um, I, there, are, there is a, a group of folks who want to have uh, a change in, in the leadership, um, and I know they're, they're pushing right now. So one thing, as folks might be aware, is that Speaker of the House, unlike any other leadership position, you essentially have to win two elections. You have to win the majority within your own caucus, but then you have to get a majority on the House floor, 218. This almost tripped up John Boehner. Um, several times uh, where he had a problem with the Freedom Caucus members. So because of th the fact that uh, any speaker has to get a majority of those voting in the election, you could have 15 to 20 or so members um, blocked or sent to speaker. I, you know, I think that anyone who has bet against Nancy Pelosi over the last 20 years has lost a lot of money. And I I'm very much a, a person who's in the camp. I'll believe it when I say it. Let's get to some questions. Uh, Frank, is there a microphone somewhere? We do have one, we're gonna set it up. So please, those of you who'd like to ask a question of uh, our two members, uh, please line up, I'll get to you. Uh, uh, I'll ask one other, is someone ready to ask a question? Please, go ahead. Uh, and um, uh, tell us just your name and uh, if you're a student here or whatever, just identify yourself quickly. And okay. And ask okay. a brief question. Okay. Uh, so, hi, my name is Gabriel. I'm studying at SMPA currently. I'm also from Puerto Rico. And this is to um, Representative Jennifer. Um, just considering just how volatile it might seem like the current administration is for reasons both good and bad, and also like the, the sort of party divide like within um, your political party, like you, for example, like you being Republican and our governor being a Democrat, like how do you think that given like all these circumstances, like how can you like effectively represent sort of that bipartisan attitude uh, through the house and make sure that like all our views, like as an island, as 3.5 million American citizens are represented? You just said, I mean, I can't, I was talking about this before coming to stage. Uh, I can't vote on the floor. So I represent 3.2 million American citizens in Congress. So that makes me uh, the member that represents more people in Congress, but I can vote. Uh, so we should have at least four to five members. And that means that I need to rely on the alliances. I need to rely on people who can actually vote. And that's the reason I can, I can lose my, my time attacking or uh, doing other things that actually having consensus on many other issues. And, and that's what I've been doing uh, since I arrived in Congress in the, during the last term. Uh, that means that most of my bills are bipartisan bills, uh, that I actually got good relations with a lot of members on the Democratic side. Uh, as a matter of fact, the Lugar Institute from George, uh, George just identify me as the member with you know 19 in more than 400 members uh, working in a bipartisan way. Um, it's not because I'm cool. It's not because I'm skinny. I think that's not the, the case here. It's about reaching, I mean, educating and, and getting relations and things done. So I can't have my time to be. Even when I may be having differences with the administration, I just prefer to sit down and try to reach out uh, an agreement on something uh, because the people of Puerto Rico deserve that. De deserve that. I, I can't be focusing in, in, in that fight because that will never get me things done. And, and in my case, I mean, and the six delegates, I mean, Northern Marianas, American Samoa, the District of Columbia, Virgin Islands, uh, Puerto Rico and Guam. I mean, we all need to do that. 
uh, in our case, uh, the, the governor is a Democrat. We ran together uh, in, in our election because we both believe in statehood. So that was the common ground. And if we actually did that back home, I think we now can, can continue to work in that way. I get a lot of my uh, Democratic uh, companions in, in the House, uh, they've been sponsoring my bills. Same thing in the Republican side. So I think it, it can be done. Uh, when I was in the state house, 80% of my house approved bills in a bipartisan way. Uh, so I don't need to disrespect somebody uh, because of an idea. I think we can reach out uh, the common ground. Yeah. Thank uh, you so much. Thank you. Others who would like to ask questions, please line up at the microphone. We'll try to get to a couple of more. Yes, ma'am. Please go ahead. Hi, my name is Heather Robinson. I'm a political science student here. Um, this question is directed to you, uh, Representative Gonzalez Colon. Um, as a representative from Puerto Rico and as a member of the president's party, are you satisfied with his efforts um, after the destruction of Hurricane Maria? You know what? Um, this is the first. Uh, is, this is not the president. This is actually the first time ever we are used to having to, to have hurricanes. Uh, but this is the first time ever we got the federal agencies on the ground before, during, and after the hurricane, both hurricanes, Irma and Maria. And uh, I mean, Puerto Rican people are always uh, helping out uh, the people from, from the other Antilles and the smaller islands, and that's actually that happens when Hurricane Irma hit us, uh, and then it came Maria. So we managed to secure, during this term, uh, $44 billion dollars for the recovery process on the island. Never before uh, in our history, and we've been part of the US for more than 120 years, we received that kind of allocation. Of course, uh, we never before got, got, got this, time, uh, this kind of devastation uh, on the island. That means that we are still needing a lot, a lot of resources for, for the recovery process and build back better. Uh, but I will tell you that uh, sometimes the president tweets something saying that he was not going to grant money for actually Medicaid in the island. Puerto Rico just received 55 cents per dollar. Uh, in the federal uh, allocation, so the states need to match 45 cents, and territories never got the money to do that. Uh, so we actually f uh, find 100% uh, federal cost share for two years in a block grant of $4.9 billion. The president tweeted against, but then he signed a bill. And his administration has been you know, working with us in many other issues that are still in the pipeline. Um, I'll, I'll tell you that I need to be focused on what the people in the island need and how to get things done. Uh, so I, I'm not used to look at the noise that we may see every day in tweets or you know sayings. If if I got the, 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 his signing, and a lot of cabinet members uh, went to the island and still are going, that never happens before. And we again we are used to hurricanes. Uh, so in in, in fairness. Uh, we, we got more attention uh, because of the media, uh, because w the work we've been doing, and the cabinet and administration have been responding. And again, we still need a lot, of, a lot more, not just the money, but provisions uh, in federal statutes that treat Puerto Rico differently. Uh, like we are not American citizens, and that's, that's not the case. Okay, good. Let's get to our next, uh, our next questioner, please. Hi, um, I'm a student here, a political communication student at the School of Media and Public Affairs here. Um, my question is predominantly for Representative Boyle, just because um, as a member of the Democratic Party, um, what kind of policy outcomes do you guys kind of expect or hope to see given the division? I know you mentioned infrastructure. Are there any like major policy outcomes that you guys can really expect to see given like the condition between the Senate and the House. Yeah, when you say division, I assume you mean divided government with Republican yeah. White House and Senate and, and under our control. Uh, so there are a couple things. First, infrastructure I, I already talked about. Second would be health care. Uh, you know, for eight years, uh, or at least since the 2010 campaign through 20, yeah, 2018, you had Republicans running on repeal and replace, repeal and replace, uh, demonize Obamacare, uh, even though it essentially was what Governor Mitt Romney did in, in Massachusetts, uh, which was quite popular, uh, and what the Heritage Foundation came up with in the 1990s, and originally Senator Bob Dole and about 17 Republican senators introduced as a market alternative to essentially a, a Medicare for all. 
Nonetheless, fast forward to 2009, 2010, Barack Obama introduces it, and now suddenly this largely market idea, yeah, suddenly he was characterized as a government run amok by this crazy, um, you know, socialist. Um, now that uh, Donald Trump has achieved the unthinkable, which is to make Obamacare popular, uh, for which I'm very grateful, uh, has its highest approval ratings ever after being underwater for the last, uh, you know, eight years. Now its approval rating is somewhere in the mid 50s and disapproval somewhere around 40%. I hope that um, Republican colleagues of mine would recognize that repeal and replace is maybe not quite as easy as, as they thought it was, number one, and number two, politically a loser for them. And so if they want to work with a number of us on the, on the other side of the aisle to say, look, Affordable Care Act is here to say, um, you're not going to suddenly throw over 20 million people off exchanges who have the private marketplace um, backed plans. Let's figure out ways that we can strengthen that product. Let's figure out ways, like in the reinsurance market, for example, where we do have a problem in certain states, uh, such as Alaska and, and Minnesota, where they've tried to address this issue. Let's try to figure out something where we can make it a more robust product. That's the kind of area now where maybe there's a, the, a greater possibility for working together than there was previously. The other thing I would say is that I, I'm the co-founder and co-chairman of something called the Blue Collar Caucus. It is a group of Democratic members, about 50 of us or so, who want to attempt to address this real problem that we have in our economy. And I say we, the United States, but also the West. And that is that if you live in a suburb of Philadelphia and you have a college education, in some ways, uh, life has never been better. Unbelievably low unemployment rate, great job prospects. Um, the new economy works for you. But if you're in other parts of Pennsylvania, if you're in northeastern Pennsylvania or some parts of southwestern PA, you don't have the benefit of a higher education, you actually were making more money 30 years ago and 40 years ago and did have better job prospects. That is a challenge for all of us who, who serve in government. It helped, I think, in many ways fuel the 2016 election in our own country, I think in some ways it helped fuel Brexit in, your, in the UK. In your, in your state. In my state, uh, it, which is a great example of it, because in different parts of my state, it is both the best of times and, and the worst of times. Um, that's something that, that all of us in government, whether Democratic or Republican, need to do a better job of figuring out how we resolve this real issue that we have in, in our economy. And what has led to a real divide of the, the haves and the have-nots. And again, I say it's a problem in the US, but it's actually a problem in other Western democracies as well. So, so those are the kind of areas that, that animate me and that I, I really want to try to work together with members on their side who, who want to get things done. Thank you. OK, we've got time for a couple more quick ones. Try to. All righty, Quick fantastic. question, quick answers, yeah. My name is Garrett. I'm a freshman political communication major from SMPA. This one's for Representative Gonzalez Colon. Um, you were talking about earlier that you ran on the prospect of statehood for Puerto Rico. Um, and how do you think Puerto Rico declaring bankruptcy last year after being $73 billion in debt is going to affect that process? Do you see statehood happening uh, within even 20 years? That's a great question. And actually, the last, during the last uh, four years, the last administration in the island was at, we're asking for bankruptcy uh, laws in, in, in the states. And actually, the governor just reached an agreement with a lot of the boneholders in, in many of the areas that were, uh, there, there were lawsuits, lawsuits. There's still a lot of uh, that debt that haven't been um, um, broke in a deal, uh, but they're working on that. And, and I do believe in, 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 the, in the rule of law. And, and one of the main issues that we did, and actually the governor of Puerto Rico just did uh, for these two years in a row, is cutting expenses. I mean, we used to have 136 local agencies. Uh, that's a lot. Uh, so he's cutting that up, up to, to 36. Uh, that means that you need to cut the size of the government, and, and that's what's been happening. Actually, he's a Democrat. Uh, so, so it's the local agenda, it's how you cut expenses, and how you grow your economy. In our case, many people here may think that tourism is our main source of income. It's not. 
uh, our main source of income is actually pharmaceutical. It is medical devices in a 42% of our economy. Uh, and then it will go to real estate, then it will go to uh, financial services, and then tourism. So how do we invest? How, how do we put the money uh, to, to create jobs and, 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 and grow more, more money on the island? Uh, I think the, the opportunity that we just got to, to prove ourselves uh, that we want to make that change, that people of Puerto Rico, I mean, you got five million Puerto Ricans living in the mainland. Five. And three on the island. It is not, people are not living in the island because of the weather. Uh, people are not living the island, uh, they're leaving the island for three reasons. First, maybe education. Second, a job. And healthcare. I mean, those three areas, uh, you, you will identify a lot of seniors, veterans, and, 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 and young people moving because of that. So I do believe that we uh, can become a state. Uh, that's the reason for the first time we got 58 members signing a bill uh, to, promote, to promote that, actually that. And I mean, our people, more than 246,000 Puerto Ricans uh, participated in the armed forces. Uh, when that casket came back, Dropping an American flag, nobody asked them if they vote for their commander in chief. So I think it's it's well overdue uh, that we become a state, uh, and I mean we are right now contributing. Why not? And and this will actually prosper our economy, and we can pay our debts because of that. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, t t we have two more up there. So two quick questions. Um, hi, thank you guys so much for being here. Um, my question is for Representative uh, Gonzalez Colon. Um, as you may know, a GW study found that 2,975 people um, died in the um, aftermath of the storms last year. Um, President Trump tweeted, uh, quote, that this was done by Democrats in order to make me uh, President Trump, look as bad as possible when I'm successfully raising billions of dollars to help rebuild Puerto Rico. Um, do you think that President Trump is telling the truth? I mean, I reply to that tweet, uh, <laughs> say that I disagree with that statement. Um, and, and why is that? I mean, it's not just that study. You got another one from Harvard. And that study was uh, commissioned by the government of Puerto Rico. And the main reason the study shows it was the lack of communication on the island not just in the local government, in the federal agencies, uh, but actually getting the message out. And this is part of the report. Um, a lot of changes need to be done. Even the FEMA administration reported that in their own report, uh, saying that there was a lot of areas that they should do different. Um, so I, I do disagree uh, with, with that uh, tweet. And in, in, the other, in the other hand, uh, this is about what, what I was telling a few minutes ago. I can focus on a tweet or getting things done. And every time we're being asking for money, for resources, for amending uh, the Staff for Act, uh, which allowed to uh, build back better on the island, everything has been approved by the president. And we got more cabinet members on the island that we want to have more, this uh, you know, uh, quickly, of course. Uh, that we want to get things done for now, of course. There's a lot of things that needs, still need need to be done, and I may disagree in, in, in a lot of those issues, but you know what, I mean, everything that we've been asking has been signed and, and, uh, and, and delivered by, by the administration. Last quick question. Thank you. Hi, my name is Ross. I am a senior here at Elliott, and I'm sorry for ending on a down note. This is for the both of you. Uh, as leaders in America, how do you view your role in the context of, and what would you do about the recent astronomical rise in political violence? Okay, thanks. Brendan. Quickly, though. I, first, I mean, I always attempt to, uh, you know, carry my own self in a way that would in no way uh, contribute to that. Um, it's not something historically, while we have had a history of, of presidential assassinations, we generally have not, you think of all the countries in the world, we're generally not one you would associate violence with in, in terms of our politics. It does show you, though, that for all of us who are in elective office, especially if you have the bully pulpit, words matter. And you don't want to say anything that would contribute, um, whether intentionally or unintentionally, to raising those temperatures. Uh, I, I would have to say, I, I, I'm constantly amazed, even though I shouldn't be surprised at this point, I am amazed 
that for the first time we do have someone in the White House who doesn't seem very interested in attempting to tamper that down. Um, previous presidents, Democratic and Republican, have really attempted to um, uh, you know, lower the temperature and, and not inflame things. And that has obviously not been uh, the, the approach of this president. That said, though, I, look, uh, taking the long view, for this country, we have gotten through other more difficult periods, whether it was the Vietnam protests and civil rights era of the 60s, whether it was the lead up to the US Civil War in the middle part of the 19th century. Um, I, I am confident, and I hope no one loses faith in our system. We will get through this. I, I totally agree on that. I mean, I, I think we, we can be passionate about what we say, and most of the time we do that in, in the floor house, or, or we do it you know, in, a, in a debate. Uh, but afterwards, we always meet. And, and we always try to, you know, talk about family matters or personal matters. Uh, may, a lot of people may not know that. Um, same thing, I, I think one of the image the president may have, um, I will tell you my case, I, I, I was supporting Marco Rubio in that primary, and uh, I got the opportunity to be with the president, and he was a totally different person. Uh, when I met with him, you know, the, the you know, the sound bites and the tweets uh, were totally different for for what I encounter in terms of getting things done and having the time. Having said that, I think we should we should encourage um, a, a, a respect a respectful way uh, to discuss the ideas and and to refer to each other. I can be passionate, but not be aggressive personally to him uh, to raise my point. Um, and I think that's something that all of us need, need, need to practice. It's an example who, who said that bar. Thank you very much. We appreciate it very much. All right. Um, all right thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks to our members of Congress. Now we've got our powerhouse political uh, group coming up here. We have three. Um, uh, Three folks, uh, I want to welcome Maggie Haberman as the White House correspondent in the New York Times. Kevin Madden, political commentator. Hi, Maggie. I knew your dad. Worked. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> Our dad and I worked on the New York Times together for many years. Um, Kevin Madden, Republican uh, consultant. And Sean Turner, thank you so much, Sean, for being here. Absolutely. And you give me a chair and I'll be cool. All right. All right. All right, so um, we heard the politicians. Now let's have some truth telling. Um, <laughs> uh, start off, Maggie. We, we started uh, with that quote from the president saying he'd be on a warlike posture. We also heard from the politicians saying, oh, we're going to look for common ground. We're going to find ways to work together. What's your best estimate of what the possibilities are that um, these hopes and aspirations we heard from the politicians are actually going to work? Or is it going to be more the warlike posture the president talked about? I, I think the most honest answer is I don't know, because we're not going to know until we know, uh, number one, who is leading the Democratic caucus uh, in the House. We are not going to know uh, what the Democratic base is going to be interested in. We're not going to know uh, how far the president's supporters uh, among the most conservative House members uh, and senators are going to let him go. So I think in um, you can see a world where this president who really is not an ideologue other than believing in Trumpism, but he doesn't really believe in, uh, he, he, even though in, in several ways on policy, he has governed like a, like a typical Republican. He's not. And he um, frankly reminds me much more of someone like Ed Koch, the New York City mayor from who he knew in the 1980s. So when he talks about infrastructure, I think he, and, and coming up with a plan, I think he means it. Uh, and he has always, to his aides said he preferred the Democrats' plan to their own plan. Um, uh, I think that on uh, drug prices, that that is an area where they think they can find common cause. But I think this all sounds good if you're completely devoid of the context of what the investigations could be. And again, we just don't really know what that's going to look like. Um, I think that and every projection right now that there's going to be you know, 84 different investigations or whatever, Axios had some number. I think that's unlikely uh, to be that high, but I think it's go there's going to be a lot of pressure on this, this incoming Congress uh, to do oversight that uh, 
you know, the, the, the current Congress didn't do. And so uh, I think that's just going to make it very difficult going forward. But we'll see. Uh, Kevin, uh, one of the things that uh, Congressman uh, uh, Boyle said was that a lot of what could well be in the Mueller report, we don't know yet. Um, and uh, while uh, Senator McConnell has said there's no need for legislation to protect the Mueller investigation because the president is not going to fire him, uh, we know from various reports he came very close to firing at one point, and we know that he's itching on some level to do it. What's your best feeling uh, and best read about the president's intentions toward the Mueller investigation? Is, this, is there an impending constitutional crisis here? Um, or do you think McConnell is right that he just uh, will not pull the trigger on that? Well, I think we've had a number of constitutional crises already, but the thing is we've had so many little ones that it doesn't feel like we've had any. Uh, so I, I, if there's one guarantee I would offer is that, yeah, we will be cruising towards and be considering a, another constitutional crisis. Um, and I, would, I, would, I was struck by the surprise that anybody had about the term warlike posture. Where has everybody been for the last two years? This has been a White House that came into office with a warlike posture from day one. Remember Sean Spicer's uh, press conference where he went out there and defied uh, the media, anybody who would disagree that um, the White House's version of the facts wasn't, um, you know, uh, wasn't viable. Um, this is a president who I think every day is, is um, driven by the idea that somehow his viability as a president is being questioned by his opponents and every single day he tries to contest those opponents some way, somehow. Um, so we will see a, the next two years uh, will be shaped by the three eyes: uh, indictments, investigations, and possibly impeachment. And the president um, will, will will have one. Um, I mean, I think he, he reflexively has one move on anything, and that is uh, to disrupt and fight. And uh, we have, a, we have a, a, a Republican Party on Capitol Hill that has actually calcified in the image of Trump, if you think about it. Like the moderates that used to exist are no longer there. Um, they're the ones that used to be the ones that would work across the aisle, and there are fewer of them right now. And so you have a, 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 essentially a, his congressional allies willing to dig in and defend him uh, in defense of some of the limited agenda uh, gains that they can make on things like judicial confirmations uh, and whatever else they can, they can pass, or, or sort of serve as a bulwark towards what they see now as a very active, progressive Democratic Party in the House. Uh, Sean, you worked in the White House press office um, in the Obama administration. What was your reaction um, when uh, the president and, and his team uh, pulled the press credentials from Jim Acosta of CNN? You know, I'll, I'll use a word that uh, a lot of young people use today that uh, I, I, I think is, is misused, but I, I think it's an appropriate use in this context. It was somewhat unprecedented. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, look, there, uh, there is a set of norms that have always been in place between the White House press corps and the people who work in the White House. And when you take a step back and you look at what's happening in the White House now under the current administration, uh, the one side of that set of norms has changed drastically. And that's what's happening on the White House side in terms of the way that they are relating to the press, the way they're treating the press, the way they're engaging with the press. Journalists are essentially doing what they've always done. Uh, they're asking questions. They're they're uh, holding the the administration account. But are they being more aggressive than in the past? I, I do think that, and, and I've, I've uh, been very vocal about this. I, I do think that uh, there are problematic issues on both sides with regard to the way that the press is is uh, is behaving. But I don't think that those things are. Uh, uh, necessarily uh, something that we have not seen before. I, I've, I've said before that I, I take issue with the degree to which the press is defending itself against the president's attacks. Uh, I, I think that uh, uh, what the press should do is continue to focus on uh, gathering the information, delivering that information to the American public, and not be so consumed with the idea that the president is attacking us, so we need to do, you know, have commercials or what have you and go out and, and beat the drum about why we're doing the job that we're doing. Simply do the job. Uh, so I, I do think that, uh, you know, with regard to taking this pass, uh, look, it was really gratifying to see other networks get on board with this lawsuit and to, uh, to back CNN up. I think that CNN is going to win this case. And I think that if, C if it were the case that they did not win, 
I think the, that, that's something we should all be concerned about because what that does is it sends a clear message to every journalist in the White House that as you seek to uh, press the, the president, as you seek to ask questions and gather information, it sends a clear message that you are doing that under the threat, under the risk of having your access taken away. And I think that would fundamentally change uh, the relationship between the press and future administrations. Well, Maggie, you're a White House correspondent. You agree that there would be a chilling effect, and, and what would it be? Uh, I don't know that there would be a chilling effect. I think that that's what the White House is going for. Uh, and I think that if, if that happens, um, then I do think that there is going to be, uh, and hopefully people will uh, rebel against it, but I think that there's going to be at least the thought in the back of people's heads of, what happens if I do X, Y, Z? Um, you know, the reality is, I think that, and I, I actually agree with a lot of what you said about the problems on, on both sides. I do think that the tone of the coverage does need to come down. I think it is not the content, but I think that everything has been a four alarm fire for two years, and actually, in fact, not everything is a four alarm fire, and that has made it harder for people to distinguish what is. So um, I think that some of the, we, we, we don't cover ourselves in glory crawling over each other and screaming, um, you know, during these pool sprays. Uh, uh, it's frankly, we end up looking bad. <laughs> it's, that's the, that's it, regardless of whether it's a, a good use of our time or not. Um, and, uh, and regardless of how little we actually get to ask this president questions because he doesn't do press conferences. Uh, but I do, generally speaking, I do think that, um, I do think it would be in the back of people's minds. And I do think that that is, I think that the White House wanted this fight regardless of what people think of how Jim Acosta comported himself during that press conference, and there is disagreement, including within the White House press corps, but, uh, but nobody thinks that I know thinks that it, there is any justification for pulling a hard pass, which is a Secret Service pass. They issue this, and there's no security reason for Jim to have lost his pass. Um, and I think the White House was looking for this. I think that they I think this is why the president called on Jim. He knew that Jim was going to be antagonistic and be, you know, sort of in his face. And I think that uh, I think the White House is is trying to stretch the bounds of what it can get away with in terms of the media. You agree with that, Kevin? Uh, I agree with a lot of what they said. Maggie knows one of my favorite movies is. Uh, broad <laughs> I was thinking is, about it when is, you were talking before. Broadcast News, and one of the great lines from Broadcast News was where um, the Albert Brooks character says, yeah, let's not forget, we're the real story. <laughs> says it sarcastically, um, because, and I think there's a lot of truth in that, is what, one of the problems is that the media has become the story. Yeah. And um, the media should be focused 100% on accountability, not on, um, on, like, on access. And um, they have now positioned themselves, or actually through the lens of some actors in the media, as um, opponents of the White House, rather than those that are, that are merely trying to hold some accountable. And if you think back to the big changes where this White House has very rarely relented on policy and changed their mind, and the president came under enormous amounts of pressure because he worried about the perception, and, and people inside the White House worried about the perception. It was never when it was a debate inside the White House or the theater of covering uh, the press conferences in the White House. Instead, it was when the media took their cameras and turned it down to the border where parents were being separated from their children. And what you saw was a very personal uh, impact, and what you saw were the facts on clear display. It had nothing to do with the theater and mechanics of press conferences in White Houses. It had nothing to do with press access. And quite frankly, that is where the story is in this country right now. It's outside of Washington, and it's with people that are having, where their, their daily lives are being impacted. So my advice to anybody who's going to fight over, you know, press passes is, you know, it's the same thing on campaigns, like get off the bus, yes. get out of the arena where the rallies are, go to the local communities and talk to people about the economy, talk to them about immigration, talk to them about tariffs, how it's affecting their lives. All of these big debates and where kitchen table issues really matter. So, I, you know, I, I know enough about journalism to get in arguments with Maggie and fellow operatives, but, 
But that, I think, is a view that I have um, come to by, by, by knowing and talking to the most respected and successful journalists. And it's also seeing how, and having worked on campaigns, knowing where these fights are won and lost. And that's outside of Washington, not here in press rooms. Yeah, I would just add to that that one of the things that's very encouraging is that this debate is happening inside mm -hmm. of the field of journalism. And I think it's a very good thing because there, when, you, when you have that introspective look and you're actually challenging each other and asking yourselves, you know, hey, are we doing what we should be doing and are we doing it the right way, then I think that that creates an opportunity for, uh, for certain journalists, for some journalists to step to the front and to uh, be the example of how to do this the right way. Yeah. Um, Maggie, let me uh, shift gears a little bit. Um, uh, when you say that, you, you said that the president wanted this and then um, within a, a day, the White House put out a uh, fundraising appeal uh, using the CNN uh, mm -hmm. fight. Uh, and it's pretty clear that, and, and that was a, an appeal sent by the president's reelect committee, mm -hmm. which exists and is operating. It's a thing, yeah. Uh, and, and so give me a sense of how you see the emerging strategy in the White House looking toward 2020. After the, the uh, 2018 midterms, mm -hmm. did the White House learn any lessons? Are they going to do anything differently? Uh, is, we're going to see the same Trump we saw in 2016. What are you sensing uh, uh, in terms of their emerging strategies? Well, it's an excellent question, and I guess the, the one point that I would make, and I think you have to apply this to many things with this administration, is there, there's a difference between the White House and the president. So there's not some holistic strategy that they're all sitting in a room and the president just goes out and executes it. Um, they spend a lot of time with a, with a top-down principal who, who likes to dictate how things go. Um, who you know, had some advisors in the West Wing, for instance, during 2018, desperately trying to get him to go to Michigan for their own particular set of issues. There was zero reason for him to be in Michigan. It was gonna hurt him, because he, he, he couldn't do enough to help in the races, and there was just sort of no sense in it, which anyone who had worked on a previous campaign tried explaining. Um, so, I mean, I think that, look, they, the lesson they learned is they know that he has a problem with women, and the lesson that they learned is that um, the, the emerging divide uh, in red states and, uh, and rural areas um, being solidly uh, you know, pro-Republican or, or a reliable Republican vote and that states with larger urban areas and suburbs uh, are swinging away from Republicans, that, that calcified. Uh, what they're gonna do about it, I think they don't know yet. Um, they know that the map is gonna have to look different next time or at least that there are problems in the map he won with. Um, there were a bunch of Midwestern states that helped him win in 2016 that did not go Republicans' way the other night, um, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Michigan. Um, the, there are areas of the Southwest that are very problematic and turning more purple, um, Nevada, Arizona. So uh, what they will do about that, I think, is the big question, and he doesn't have another speed. I mean, I don't think we're gonna see a different Trump. We've never seen a different Trump. One of the, one of the things that I, I continue to be amazed by are the, the, the level to which people act as if he didn't tell you exactly who he was and what he was gonna do during the campaign. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is him, it has been him this entire time. The coverage of the campaign was very similar to what the coverage of the administration has been like. Uh, all about chaos, all about moods, all about uh, sort of a lack of preparation. What is different this time is he has, to your point, a professionalized operation. Whereas 2016 was this sort of ragtag band Pirate of ship. people. Yeah, and, and that actually helped him succeed because he likes doing things on the fly. I don't know how he's going to do when he's got a, a sort of a. a, a but that, just because he has that operation doesn't mean he's going to listen to them. Yeah. Well, it doesn't mean he's going to listen to it, but it does mean that it puts certain constraints on what he can do. It means that there is actually um, a large um, small dollar fundraising apparatus that they didn't have last time. It means that because he is the sitting president, there are going to be constraints on his schedule that didn't exist last time. Um, it's going to mean that he's going to have to in theory, pull away from campaigning and, and go do uh, certain things as president. So I, that to me is the big question mark, but in terms of personality, I mean, look at how he was the final two months of 2018. He spent the final two months of 2018 uh, demagoguing immigrants um, and um, 
mocking uh, Judge Kavanaugh's accusers. So I think that tells you where 2020 is going to go. And, and the last point I would make is that if 2016 seemed like a negative campaign, <laughs> 2020 is going to be an, an anchor to the bottom. Uh, it's going to be, it's going to be- Brick tied to a cinder block. Very, very, very ugly. Um, so. um, hey, Kevin, do you think Republicans have learned anything from this last campaign? Now, I, as they've defended themselves by saying, history shows they always lose seats in an off-year election. They had an unusual number of retirements in part. It was a self-inflicted wound because they term-limited their own committee chairman and, 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 and induced them to, to retire. Um, and uh, and they, it was within kind of the bounds of historic uh, projections. Yeah. But still, it was a blow to a president who says, I'm a winner and I, and I, and I love winning. Lessons here for the Republican Party from this election? Well, learning lessons and then applying and changing uh, attitudes or, or actions, I think, is very two different very things. So I think what they've learned is that the president is a huge drag with uh, in suburban areas right now and some of the fastest growing areas of the country. Um, and it's no longer just your traditional um, big metropolitan areas and swing states. So every campaign uh, I've ever worked on on a presidential level, I've worked on three, I was obsessed with Columbus, Ohio, Philadelphia, Denver, um, and, uh, and then increasingly Richmond and Charlotte. Now it's, we suffered losses and have problems in places like Kansas City, Oklahoma City, right? So like it's areas of the country now where, where you see demographic uh, changes taking place in some of these areas and uh, a recoil at this, at this president and the party's profile. So those are, those are big, so I think Republicans know that, the numbers speak for themselves, right? Every campaign's now uh, touting how they are data driven. Um, but the sole thing driving them is uh, we're always going to need our base and the one thing that animates our base and motivates our base right now is support for this president. And you've seen it in the numbers of you look at the president's support inside the party, it hovers around 90%. There are no Republicans that are going to confront that if they want to uh, win re-election. And all of, the, uh, all of the folks that learned the toughest lesson, which is losing their jobs in this midterm, are gone. And the ones that all were able to like jump off the ship and swim to shore and survive, they're all looking around and they're like, the reason I survived was the president was in my, in my, in my state or in my district, drumming up the immigration issue, firing up my base. I'm going to do what I can to stick with him. Yeah. So, Lessons learned, sure. Lessons applied and changes made, I don't think there will be many. Mm -hmm. uh, by the way, we're, well, I'll get to your question in just a minute. So anybody got a, a couple of quick questions, please get to the microphone now so we, won't have, we don't have to waste any time. I'll ask you one more quick question for you, Sean. Sure. In terms of the Democrats, what do you think the lessons they've learned or should be learning from this last election? Because there were some downsides too. This was not a total bl blue wave. Florida's still a key state uh, that went for the Republicans. Georgia. Uh, a key state that went for the Republicans. Ohio, governorship, still in, in, in Republican hands. So what are some of the lessons you think Democrats should be learning? Sure, well, I think, I think it's important to point out that I don't think they, they only learned lessons from what happened on the Democrat side. I think they also learned lessons from what happened on the Republic side, Republican side. I think, as, as uh, Maggie was pointing out, I mean, if you, if you look at the map and you look at where Republicans won, and, and uh, you look historically at those areas that should not have been in play for uh, Democrats at all, and you look at the numbers, well, you see that Democrats were, even when, where Democrats lost, a lot of those areas, they were very strong. And so one of the things they learned is they can compete in those areas. Like Texas. Absolutely, like Texas. Yeah. You, you, and you look at uh, what, certainly what happened, what's going on with uh, some of the gov governor races where the Democrats didn't win, but they were, they were very, very close. Uh, so I think that one of the things they learned is they, is, is they learned that, uh, you know, we need to put more effort in, in, into these areas. Uh, I, I think that the Democrat Party is learning something about itself with regard to uh, the kind of candidates that are being successful. Uh, Demo Democrats who won some of the uh, traditionally red districts are Democrats who, you know, they, they certainly had to moderate a little bit. And there's this debate in the party as to whether or not the party is moving way to the left or the party needs to moderate. And what you saw in this past election is you saw both of, the, you saw candidates win who are on, on both sides of that, that spectrum. I mean, you had, uh, 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 Ocasio-Cortez, who's on, on one of that, but then you had some more, much more but moderate Democrats. The Bronx is not exactly America. Uh, it's not, it's not. You said that, I didn't. Uh, 
Uh, but but I, I do think that what the party learned is, is, is that there is no singular formula that's going to work with regard to the kind of candidate that they've got to put forward. They have to really focus on looking at the, the individual areas and developing candidates that are going to be just right for those Except people. they do have to pick one person to oppose Donald Trump. Yes, they do, and there will be a lot to pick from. Hmm. <laughs> um, yes. Uh, uh, and maybe even Senator Klobuchar. Uh, okay, go ahead, ask your question, please. Hi, um, my name's Veronica, and I'm a sophomore here at SMPA. Um, my question's for Maggie. Um, President Trump has really energized his base on the idea that journalists can't be trusted, that they systematically re misrepresent them, and that they lie to them. Um, as a journalist who's been personally attacked by Trump more than once, do you think that it's the responsibility of journalists to reach out to these people that don't trust them, improve their legitimacy, improve their trustworthiness, or do you think it's a lost cause? Um, I think it's our job to be accurate and trustworthy in our news, regardless of whether the president is attacking us. And I think that to Kevin's point about, you know, let's never forget we're the real story, not the people we cover, I think that the president has... Um, thrown bait at us and we've taken it a lot of the time and I think that's a problem and I don't think that helps us gain trust. Um, I, I think that the media as a, and there, I sort of hate the phrase the media because there is no, it's not a monolith. Um, and even, even mainstream media is not a monolith anymore. Um, but I think that we, the collective we have done a fair amount to erode people's confidence and all on our own without President Trump over the last 25 years and so and, and longer. Uh, I, but I think that he has certainly poured accelerant on it. I don't, what I find frustrating, I mean, obviously I, I find what he is doing incredibly dangerous and distressing and it's got ramifications well outside of the United States. What I do also find distressing, not equally, but I, I do think is a problem is um, part of, I think, the, the performance art aspect of the media fighting with Trump that you are seeing that we've talked about on stage tonight is there is a big push by the president's critics to try to make the media the opposition party too. And I think that people are really struggling with, you know, I think, I think this presidency has been disorienting for many people, and I think the media is doing the best job it possibly can with a lot of uh, shifting winds, so. Thank you. Thank you, go ahead. Hello, my name is Tyler. I'm a sophomore at GW with political science and computer science. My question is also for Maggie. So you've worked for three very different outlets, the New York Post, Politico, and the New York Times. Which institution do you think had the greatest impact on how you do and view your work? I'll forget the Daily News. I was gonna say, you forgot the Daily News. Thanks, Kevin. <laughs> I, I met Kevin in 2004 when I was at the Daily News. Um, I, I, uh, it's, a, it's a great question. I would. I would say the New York Post because I worked there the longest. I mean, I, I spent 10 years there. Um, and if I didn't work at the New York Post, I think I would be so flummoxed by Donald Trump that I wouldn't know what to do with it. So, um, so I think certainly for what I do now, it shaped it. But, but I would say in terms of covering government too. I mean, I, I, I covered Rudy Giuliani as mayor and I first went to City Hall in 99. Um, and that was my first experience. Uh, covering the city uh, in that way and covering a, a, an elected official. Um, and the, the press ethos in New York is very different than it is in DC. Um, it tends to be much more historically, but pre-2017, it's more genteel uh, and there's more of a mingling of um, the people you cover and the reporters. And that's much less so in New York. It's, it exists, but it's not quite the same. Um, and the New York Post basically, you know, is a tabloid that collectively would wake up uh, with the ethos of punching you in the face with a two by four every day. <laughs> and, um, and sometimes when, peop when, when it comes to actually keeping government officials accountable, that's not a bad thing necessarily. So, um, so, for, so that I would say that it was, it was that. Thank you for that question. Not the answer you expected, I bet. <laughs> Go ahead. Hello, my name is Mark and I'm a junior in SMPA and political communication. My question is also for Maggie. Um, and I wanted I to ask you, to the side if you, I'm sorry. I said I could just do this off to the side if you want. <laughs> <laughs> but, sorry, yes. um, but my question for you is that you will post multiple stories a day um, on the Times website. And I know you said in interviews that you have 16 hour days a lot. Um, and so what does a typical day look like for you? 
That's also a very thoughtful and nice question. Thank you. Um, <laughs> uh, today began at uh, 7 in the morning. This is my duty week uh, covering the White House. We rotate, so there's six of us covering the president, which is a huge number um, for our White House team. It used to be four. Uh, but the sheer when I volume. covered the White House for the Times, there were two. Okay, see, um, <laughs> the uh, the sheer volume has been very hard to keep up with. Um, a day can a day we usually start at seven a.m. and it ends at about nine, and it will include today's. This is panel number two, um, and uh, it will include uh, you know usually at least one story, um, and and then just very. I, it, there is a constant feeling of being on a treadmill that where the speed keeps going a little bit faster uh, covering this White House. Um, it has gotten somewhat better, but uh, as we are reaching what could be an interesting period with the Mueller investigation, it's gotten a little busier. So the, the days are still very long, and I don't ex expect that that's ever going to end um, as long as he's president. Thank you. Thank you. Someone got a question for somebody else? <laughs> Uh, yeah, for anyone okay. who wants to take it. <laughs> think, think of a new this question. Is just a general yeah. question. No, no. Um, so do you think Amy Klobuchar is going to run for president? I think we're all, at least in this room, thinking that. And then also, uh, <laughs> with the election cycles getting longer and longer, uh, when do you think uh, the first few major candidates will jump in? They already have. 2020. 2020, <laughs> 2020 started at 9 p.m. Yeah, on election exactly. night this Absolutely. last Tuesday. Yeah. Right, yeah. And, um, you know, I, I will say this about Klobuchar. Um, she has exactly the right message, and, which was, she said, unifying, optimistic, uh, and, you know, focused on, on the, the, the real impact that people have. What I don't know if she has yet, or any of the Democrats have, is the right tempo. And tempo is actually really crucial in this because if you're not on offense in a what, campaign, what do you mean by tempo? By meaning if you're not on offense in a campaign, you're losing. And Donald Trump had nothing on substance. He wasn't unifying. He wasn't optimistic. But every single day, he was controlling the tone and tenor and the issue sort of the campaign. Hillary Clinton was constantly on defense. That is how he won. Um, and nobody has yet convinced me that they have the Democratic version of that. You see people say, well, maybe Mario Cuomo, or I'm sorry, uh, Andrew Cuomo, uh, <laughs> Terry McAuliffe. Uh, Mario Cuomo would have been good, but. Um, Mario Cuomo York, couldn't, Mar I'm also Mario Cuomo couldn't decide what he was gonna have for lunch. Well, yeah, I mean, or, you know, or whether he wanted to be on the Supreme Court. But, yeah. but nobody has actually said, Here is, here's how we're gonna run this campaign against it. So if you think you're gonna run a technocratic, policy wonk who is going to avoid Donald Trump all the time and just talk about the earned income tax credit, right? Like, that's not going to win. And that's going to be, that'll be very challenging to, to win. So, and then the last thing is, don't feel bad because I'm actually here to hear what Maggie has to say too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was wondering, what did you have for lunch today, Maggie? I'm kidding. <laughs> Hi, um, this question is for um, Mr. Madden. Um, Representative Boyle touched on a, uh, an emerging theme that's occurring not just here in the US, but uh, you know, across the West in particular was, um, um, you know, it uh, was very apparent in the 2017 French uh, election um, of, the, of this, uh, the haves and the have nots yeah. and those that are, um, uh, becoming um, or are um, market skeptical. Um, yeah. um, I, I guess my question is, Kevin, is uh, there seems to be uh, that is particularly um, seems to be an issue that is ascendant in the Republican Party. Um, and I wanted to ask, um, well, why Match Lab invited Marine Le Pen's niece to CPAC this year, and what, what direction you think the Republican Party is heading in? Yeah, well, uh, let me answer that Le Pen one quick while I'm thinking of it. Um, they invited her and then disinvited her, or she declined or something. There was some big, and they, they admitted it was a huge mistake. But I think it goes to a core problem that you have inside the Republican Party on the, on the question of what is, what does it mean to be a conservative? And conservative used to be about ideas and issues and a reform-oriented agenda, right? 
Now it's actually your conservatism is defined by whether or not your what your tone is. Are you angry? Are you against somebody? Have you decided to what you're against and and why you're against it and who should be punished for it? And that's a very two very different views of conservatives. And I think there's about 15 to 20 percent in the Republican Party. I consider myself a part of it, which is I want to define our views of the party and issues by what we're for and why we're for them. And then there's the other part, which is ascendant and dominating in the party right now, which is the Trump wing, which is, no, let's define what we're against and see if we can exploit some of these divisions to our political advantage. And that's kind of what's happening. And that's why you see APAC, or, sorry, the um, a CPAC is very different from the CPAC that I used to go to 10 years ago. Um, so I think there's, there's that. On the haves and have nots, it's a very real thing. I mean, the, the, we, the Republican Party in 2008, I was part of the campaign in 2012, our message to a lot of these voters was, what you need is more free trade, what you need is a more modernized economy, and by the way, immigration can be a good thing to help grow our party and, and help grow our um, uh, you know, our, the, our view of the American economy. And the bunch of people who haven't had pay raises in 20 years, who are living in very rural areas said, uh, no, I don't want that. Um, that's what's bad, and you're not listening to me. So, and you see this happen not only capitals like the United in, in the United States, but it's capitals around the globe where there is a canyon between what politicians think is the right approach and based on on you know um, based on on policy principles, and then the, this feeling of being left behind or having their status threatened uh, inside the American economy today, and that's been the big gap right now and Donald Trump spoke directly to it in 2016 and as a result has sort of remade remade the party in his own image. You know it's interesting Kevin when you look at the fundraiser that the Trump campaign put out around the CNN uh, issue and the cost issue yeah. they kept saying we're being insulted and uh, people are, uh, are demeaning us it was all still that sense of grievance that we saw yeah. Uh, two years ago, playing on that on that very that yeah, very language. Very real thing, yeah. Last question. Hi, um, my name is Savannah. I'm a senior uh, studying political communication. So if anyone's hiring, let me know. <laughs> um, my question is less about Trump versus the media, more about the media versus itself. Um, in this ever changing and fast paced news cycle, this goes to anyone, by the way. Um, I just am wondering how you think the media can combat, or if it should combat, the fast paced news cycles and really important stories getting buried by scandals and things like that. Like there was a recent New York Times article about major tax fraud and schemes um, done by Trump and his father, and how he's getting all these, it's just a lot of messy stuff, obviously, and it just seems like no one really paid attention to it. So I was wondering what you think the media's role in that is, if anything. Let me, uh, let me have Sean answer that. Go ahead. Sure. I, I think there are a lot of different perspectives on this, and uh, uh, this is one that people often disagree with. But I often think of the media as a supply and demand business. And uh, a lot of people get frustrated when I kind of turn, turn that, that very question kind of back on, uh, on us as news consumers. You know, if you turn on CNN and... Uh, uh, you've got people on a panel uh, like me, and you know people are sitting there, and they're kind of you know yelling at each other and sniping at each other from the left and the, and the right. And you keep watching, and you keep going back, and you keep watching more. And you watch not only when you're at home, but you watch when you're at work, and you listen to it in the car going home. What you're saying is that this is what you want. You're saying that this is what I, uh, you, you know, I I, I want to consume. And I think that to some degree, it's incumbent upon us to say to send a message to the news media that that's not what we want. And when we send that message, then guess what the news media is going to do? They're going to make adjustments. And when they make that adju those adjustments, then I think we get more of, of what we want. So uh, I think there are a lot of different ways that this can happen. I think it can happen with individual journalists. Uh, I, I, you know, we talk, talked about this in an event last night. I think people like Marty Baron doing, are doing a great job of, of uh, keeping journalism pure. But I think that we've got to look at what we're demanding from the news media and make some adjustments ourselves. I'm going to ask each of you one very quick question to end up. Who do you think the New York Times, who do you think is going to be the Democratic nominee in 2020? I'm not falling for that one again. Oh, jeez. Oh, <laughs> Nobody's going to no, answer I, no, I, I think it's somebody that we're not talking about right now. I don't know who that is. John, uh, <laughs> last word. Uh, President Joe Biden and Vice President Barack Obama. <laughs> all right. That's a good way to get Thank it. Good answer. Thank you all three of you. <laughs> Give the fan. Thank you, Haberman, Kevin Madden, Sean Turner. Thanks so much. Great being with you.